Good evening, everyone. It is my honor and pleasure to welcome Dr. Raul Kushwa, who is an accomplished scientist, entrepreneur, and co-founder and chief scientific officer of Anant Life, a leader in clinical genetic testing. He has a vast experience in different areas of human diseases, particularly stem cells, genetics, immunology, and regenerative personalized medicine. Dr. Kushwa is also the co-founder of Predict, Predict Medics, Inc., a publicly traded artificial intelligence health tech company. Having received numerous prestigious awards, he is a regular speaker in international circuits, a reviewer editor for several medical journals and author of many peer-reviewed articles. Raul currently teaches Understanding Genetics for Improving Health Outcomes at the Institute of Holistic Nutrition's Continuing Education Department. And if there's anything else you'd like to add, Raul, please let us know. Let's welcome Raul Kushwa. Well, thank you, Elizabeth, for the wonderful introduction. And uh, you know what, as you were talking about, this is definitely something I look forward to every year. And uh, not being able to do that for the past 15 months, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's a new reality, I guess. Uh, but uh, again, thanks for the introduction and uh, welcome everyone. Thanks for your time. So today our focus is going to be on how genetics plays a role in nutrition and detoxification. And just considering the, uh, the overall environment the world is in, I think the uh, human genetic side does come to the forefront. Because when you look at susceptibilities to infections, how your body fights infections, and how at times the underlying immune response can take over and perhaps lead to uh, uh, morbidity or even death, uh, a lot of it actually uh, simply depends on the underlying genetics. And that's where um, I would say that there needs to be a greater push for incorporating genetics and clinical medicine. Because, uh, I mean, we all know that uh, we have these underlying differences in our genes. And it's about how can we utilize these underlying differences to make sure that perhaps we can have targeted therapies, uh, targeted nutritional programs, or uh, targeted detoxification programs. And that's what we will be talking about in, uh, in today's lecture with our focus uh, being on uh, nutrition, uh, detoxification and exercise genetics. So um, I guess the biggest uh, breakthrough in the field of genetics was perhaps the sequencing of the human genome. Um, it, I mean, the sequencing was actually initiated in 1990. And it took around 11 years for the first draft to be published. But again, when this draft was published, it was pretty much, uh, again, you're talking about a bunch of ATGCs. And even now, we have not truly identified all the genes, all the regulatory elements. That's something which is still happening. So in other words, as much as we say that we do understand human genetics, there is still a lot more we need to identify. But the key is when the human genome was sequenced, it really opened the door to personalized healthcare, and particularly for uh, nutrition, fitness, pharmacogenetics, disease risk. So, for instance, somebody could be uh, having a higher predisposition of breast cancer, and that's because of the underlying genetics. And that is how you use genetics to look at the underlying disease risk. Uh, the other one is pharmacogenetics. So, uh, certain individuals. Uh, show a greater efficacy of a certain medications and certain medications lead to adverse effects. All that is governed by your genes because your genes are playing a role in how these medications are metabolized. Uh, the next one is uh, nutrition. Somebody could be genetically susceptible to develop certain nutritional deficiencies, or for instance, somebody may just need more of vitamin B12 simply because of the underlying genetics, because again, they cannot absorb it that well. So that's the nutritional genetics. Coming to fitness genetics, while well, certain exercise regimens can have a greater impact in, on an individual's health, and certain ones can have the complete opposite effect. And how it impacts an individual's body is dependent on their underlying genetics. So using the genetic makeup of an individual and coming up with personalized nutrition, personalized fitness plan, uh, a plan to understand what kind of medications leads to adverse effects, what works in their body, and identifying disease risk, all this is what we refer to as personalized healthcare. 
And um, again, talking about genetics, um, it all goes down to DNA, which is deoxyribonucleic acid, which is also referred to as the life molecule. So when you look at the cell, the cell has two main components. There is the nucleus, which is the, uh, the round structure depicted uh, on the image to the right. Uh, and that's uh, within the cell. And inside the nucleus, you have these condensed structure called chromosomes. Uh, humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes. So what it means is that there are uh, 46 chromosomes in each and every cell. And chromosome is primarily DNA, which is wrapped up with proteins and is sitting in a highly condensed form. But again, all of the chromosomal material that's present in the nucleus is pretty much the blueprint of the individual. And that is what we need to understand and we need to utilize when we are going into personalized healthcare. And DNA itself is composed of nucleotides. So DNA at the end of the day is essentially uh, a molecule with a, with a sugar backbone. So um, uh, if you look at the structure here and where uh, it's denoted by the letter S, those are pretty much all sugar molecules that are joined by a phosphodiester bo ester bond. And there are four different bases that are there to generate the entire DNA of any individual. And these are four primary sugars, which are pretty much A, T, G, C, and a combination of any three of them has the instructions for an amino acid. So let's say if we take AGT here, and then there is ACG. So this, this triple combination in a sequence actually codes for an amino acid, which then goes, uh, goes on to code for a protein. So essentially from D DNA, you get mRNA, which is essentially a messenger molecule, and that mRNA leads to the development or, or, or uh, production of protein. And DNA itself contains the recipe in terms of how that protein should be produced. And when you look at the chromosome, as I said, the chromosome is composed of pretty much condensed DNA. Every part of the chromosome or every part of the DNA that codes for a protein is called a gene. And again, it's only a small chunk of our entire DNA that codes for proteins. And so far, we have identified around 30,000 genes in the human genome. But at the same time, uh, although most of the DNA tends to be non-coding, it plays a very important regulatory role in uh, activating and deactivating these genes. And a lot of it is still something that we need to understand to fully get a grasp of personalized healthcare. So as I was saying, uh, DNA is present in the nucleus. And from the nucleus uh, out of DNA, you actually uh, get a copy of it, which we can call, which is called RNA. This copy goes into the cytoplasm, which is essentially outside the nucleus. And then ribosomes, uh, they pretty much use the instruction, which is present on the RNA molecule to produce the protein. And on the right here, I want to illustrate that what it means when someone has a mutation. So um, on the left here, uh, let's say we have a gene, um, and this is the sequence. Well, GCCG is the normal sequence that's highlighted in blue here. And uh, this DNA leads to RNA production. RNA uh, produces a protein, and that's your normal functional protein, which has a normal characteristic. characteristic. Uh, this can code for a functional enzyme, where let's say uh, this blue circular substrate binds to the enzyme and is converted and is processed into something else, which is depicted as this blue square. Now, what happens when a mutation arises? So let's say normally there was GCCG present. Now there's a mutation whereby this the C turns into a G. So although it's a mutation of a single nucleotide or, or of, a, of a single sugar, what that can do is that can actually make the protein completely non-functional. And once the protein is non-functional, what you have is a loss of function. So normally what that protein was doing, it's not able to do that anymore. So the enzyme that comes out of it is mutated. So now you can have this blue substrate depicted by the blue circle here, but again, it's not going to bind to this protein. So it's not going to be processed into the form which is needed by the body. And that's why it's very important to understand what kind of mutations an individual's DNA is carrying before we come up with any nutritional uh, detox or, uh, or even an exercise plan. 
So overall, when we come back to how nutrients are absorbed by human cells, uh, I mean, this is, again, a very simplistic view, uh, but the point that I want to make here is how, how do slight subtle changes in proteins, which is pretty much mutations, impact nutrient absorption? So first and foremost, uh, I mean, uh, this blue square here is representative of a cell. And let's say there is a nutrient present in the environment for this nutrient to go into the cell it has to be taken in by nutrient transporters. These are essentially proteins and their function is, let's say, to bring this nutrient into the cell. A lot of these nutrients cannot be used by our cells in the form in which they are absorbed. So for several nutrients, we have these secondary enzymes that are present in the cell. They will bind to the nutrient and they will convert it into the bioactive form. And it is the bioactive form which can be used by our cell for different physiological processes. So now imagine someone has a mutation which impacts the uh, function of this nutrient transporter. Well, what happens then is you can have as much of this nutrient present in the person's body, but still they will develop deficiency because the cells are not going to be able to take up the nutrient. And this is what I mean when I say that your individual DNA or the mutations that you're carrying really dictates that what the nutritional plan should be. On the flip side, let's say somebody does have a normal nutrient transporter or a fully functional nutrient transporter. Well, the nutrients can go into the cell, but now let's say we have another individual that has a mutation in the enzyme. And this enzyme has a role of converting the nutrient into the form which can be used by the cell. So if there is a mutation here, again, you'll have a lot of nutrients coming into the cell, but it will not be able to be converted to a form which can be used by our body. And in that scenario, again, the individual will have a very high susceptibility to develop nutritional deficiency for that specific nutrient. But again, you can only have these answers if you look at the genetic makeup of the individual. So there are many different nutrients for which uh, a clear genetic component has been identified in terms of paying, playing a role in predisposition to nutritional deficiencies. Uh, these include vitamin A, vitamin B6, vitamin B12, uh, choline, vitamin C, D, E, folate, calcium, iron, magnesium, selenium, and zinc. Now, to illustrate the role of genetics and nutrient absorption, uh, I mean, one of the examples I'll show you is that of vitamin A. So for vitamin A, there are two main sources of it. Uh, one is, of course, uh, the, uh, the source that comes from plants, which is the beta carotene, and the other sources from animals, which is retinol. But when your body is uh, taking in beta carotene, for that to be converted to a bioactive form, it has to be converted to retinaldehyde first. And the process of converting beta carotene into retinaldehyde is governed by an enzyme called BCO1. So as you can imagine, if someone has a mutation in this enzyme, they will not be able to effectively convert beta carotene into retinaldehyde and they will be developing a nutritional deficiency. And it turns out that it's a good chunk of the population. So around 45% of the population, they are carrying this mutation in BCO1 where they cannot efficiently convert beta carotene into retinaldehyde. Uh, and the most common mutation is referred to as the T allele variant, where there is in fact a 69% reduction in the enzymatic activity of BCO1. So what it means is, let's say you run genetic analysis on the individual, you identify that they are carrying T variant of BCO1, which is reducing the activity of the enzyme, then what it means is that in these individuals, they should be recommended to be having more of retinol because that is the form their body is going to be able to absorb. Because if, even if they have more beta carotene, there is a good chance that they'll still have nutritional deficiency because of the underlying genetic makeup of the individual. Um, the other example I'll illustrate to you guys is that of folate and genetics. I mean, of course, uh, you all know that it's an essential, essential nutrient. Deficiency can lead to anemia, and in pregnant females, there can be neural brain defects in babies. Now, for folic acid or dietary folate to be absorbed by the body, it has to be converted into 5-MTHF. And 
this process is primarily governed by an enzyme called MTHFR, which is involved in the conversion of folate or folic acid into the bioactive form, which is 5-MTHF. As such, if someone is carrying mutations in MTHFR, that will directly impact and lead to pretty much folate deficiency because you can give them all the folic acid and dietary folate, their body will not be able to convert it into the bioactive form. Um, and again, I mean, uh, looking at this table, I don't want to go into the excruciating details here, but the take home message is that close to half of the population is in fact carrying mutations in MTHFR, which can lead to a significant reduction in, uh, in the enzymatic activity. So what that means is a good chunk of the population has this mutation. And in these individuals, you can give them supplementation with dietary folate, but that is never going to be enough. Instead, what they'll need is supplementation with methylfolate, which is the bioactive form. And again, to decipher these, this, uh, this information and to come to this conclusion, you will need to look at the uh, genetic makeup of the individual. So overall, uh, Looking at the genetics of the individuals and coming up with a nutritional plan is what we refer to as nutritional genetics. And uh, genetics can uh, help us identify that an individual, I mean, what kind of uh, deficiencies they are at a risk for. And uh, based on that, we can come up with nutritional plan uh, to prevent those deficiencies. Uh, at the same time, uh, looking at the genetics will help, will help us identify that which should be the preferred source of the nutrient for the individual. But the Key, but the key take home message is that what this is telling us is that you cannot have a one plan, a single plan that works on everyone. You have to look at the underlying genetic makeup of the individual to come up with a plan which suits, their, suits the needs of their bodies because that is governed by the underlying DNA. Um, the second aspect I'll be touching on is uh, weight loss and genetics. So overall, uh, when there is planning for weight loss, it primarily involves dietary changes and perhaps a fitness plan as well. And normally what is seen is that there tend to be uh, three different outcomes. Uh, I mean, the first one is that you offer a weight loss plan to somebody, there is no impact. In other words, there is no weight loss. Some individuals, uh, they show a slight weight loss, and then you have some individuals that show a dramatic weight loss. So why is this sort of difference we tend to see when there is a generic weight loss plan? Well, the answer lies in the genetic makeup of the individual. And uh, one of the examples I can give you is that as of monounsaturated fats and weight loss. Uh, overall, um, I mean, studies show that uh, broadly speaking, a diet which is rich in monounsaturated fats typically supports weight loss. I'm, and I'm not denying that it does not. What I'm saying is, yes, it helps certain individuals, but for a certain set of individuals, you can provide them all of the monounsaturated fats you want, and still it won't make a difference. And that is because of PPAR gamma 2, which is a gene that encodes for a protein that plays a role in metabolism of fat. And ProAlla2 is the specific allele of this gene or is the specific variant of this gene, which has an interaction with weight loss. So uh, this is taken uh, from a study and overall uh, what the study showed was that individuals uh, who are carrying the G allele, uh, which is the light gray bars uh, here in this graph. And if you give them uh, these individuals a diet which is greater than 56% uh, monounsaturated fat from the fat content standpoint, these individuals do show a, a significant reduction in BMI. But in contrast, individuals who are carrying the C allele, even if you increase their, their fat content or their, or their fat intake to 56% uh, uh, being monounsaturated fat rich diet, they do not show any significant loss in BMI, or in other words, they do not have weight loss with increasing monounsaturated fat consumption. So overall, what this tells us is that your underlying genetics is playing a role in terms of how a lot of these different foods are helping you lose, lose weight. Because again, if you have this pro ala 2 PPAR gamma 2 variant, uh, it's only then that the intake of monounsaturated fats will help promote and perhaps expedite weight loss. If you do not have the variant, I mean, you can be on this generic plan where you need to increase your monounsaturated fat intake, but it will not make a difference because the individual is just not going to lose weight. 
Now, as I was saying, uh, any uh, well, any uh, the, the second part to uh, any weight loss program tends to be uh, exercise or fitness. And overall, the consensus is that uh, if you do a lot more strength training, that is going to uh, it, well, it's going to promote muscle gain. And if you have more muscle, you'll be burning more calories and that will lead to weight loss. But it turns out this is not the case for everyone. And this comes down to a gene referred to as insect 2. Um, and uh, what it tells us pretty much is that if you're carrying a certain variant of insect 2 and you're doing a lot of strength training, it will actually lead to fat gain and not muscle gain. In other words, it will have the opposite effect compared to what you're looking at based on a weight loss plan. Um, so, uh, so overall, um, I mean, uh, the data here is taken from a study and what the study showed was um, that on the left, um, it's the, uh, the subcutaneous fat volume in the biceps, which are measured in two different sets of individuals. Uh, one set of individuals had the C allele of insect 2 the other set of individuals had G allele. And it turned out that individuals who had the C allele in particular, they actually had a significant gain in subcutaneous fat with regular strength training. And what that tells us is that if you run a genetic analysis of an individual and the individual is showing presence of C allele, then there is no way that you should be recommending them to go heavy with strength training, because if they do that, that will have the complete opposite effect. I mean, these individuals will end up gaining fat and they will not gain muscle. And that's why it's the DNA-based weight loss plans that actually show true efficacy. So on the left here, I mean, this is taken from um, a study or from an article that came out in Wall Street Journal uh, a long time ago. Um, and uh, pretty much the take-home message was that when individuals are given a diet, which is uh, based on their genes, then uh, there is uh, almost 290% uh, more weight loss seen than when they are given a generic diet. So overall, when we factor genetics into uh, coming up with a weight loss plan of the individual, we are, uh, we, are, we are making sure that the outcome of the weight loss plan tends to be dramatic weight loss. And it's only then when you're prescribing a DNA-based weight loss plan that you will be seeing and seeing true efficacy for any client that you're working with. And uh, that is the importance of genetics when you're talking about a weight loss plan along with a nutritional or a dietary plan. So with weight loss genetics, uh, genetics can help identify what kind of dietary interventions will promote weight loss dietary interventions that will not work on the individual to promote weight loss. Uh, we can identify what kind of exercises will not promote weight loss, and we can identify what kind of exercises will promote weight loss. And once you have these answers, then you can come up with a DNA-based weight loss plan where the only outcome tends to be uh, true efficacy, where the individuals do in fact see uh, weight loss when they go on a DNA-based uh, weight loss plan. Now, the other, uh, com uh, the other aspect I'll, I'll be touching upon a bit is uh, the controversy behind dietary components. Um, and again, um, I mean, this tends to be a lot better when I do it in class because then I get to ask people questions. I uh, can't do that here. But overall, I mean, uh, just simple things. Like if I were to ask you guys, is coffee bad for you or is it good for you? I mean, good chunk of you would say it's, it's bad for me. I mean, caffeine is, is a really bad thing. And some individuals are going to say, no, it's good for you. And same thing goes for sodium. But the reality is that there is, there is not a straightforward answer. A lot of these dietary components can be, uh, can be magical for your body, or at times they can be poisonous to an individual because that depends on their underlying genetic makeup. So uh, the first example we'll be talking about is, uh, is coffee. Is it good for you or is it bad for you? I mean, you just got to uh, Google this. Is coffee good for you or bad for you? And what you'll see is that there are certain reports talking about uh, how um, caffeine intake uh, can uh, lead to blood pressure, cardiovascular disease. And then you see other studies that are showing that it's good for you. So why is there this difference between studies with one reporting that coffee is good for you and the other one is saying that, no, it's absolutely the worst thing for your body. Well, the missing link is a gene or, or is a protein, which is encoded by CYP1A2. It's part of the detoxification family. And this is the gene or the protein, which plays a role in metabolism of caffeine. 
So overall, when caffeine uh, goes into our body, uh, what it does is it actually binds to adenosine receptors. So normally adenosine, when, it's bind, when it binds to its receptors, it leads to vasodilation, which actually reduces blood pressure. But caffeine blocks this activity, and that's why caffeine is uh, associated with vasoconstriction or increase of blood pressure in certain individuals. Now, the rate-limiting steps tends to be the CYP1A2 enzyme, because when coffee enters your bloodstream, uh, it is in fact converted to three different individual constituents. One is uh, uh, paroxetine, which promotes lipolysis. There is theobromine, which dilates or open up, opens up blood vessels. And then there is theophylline, which relaxes smooth muscles. So caffeine by itself leads to vasoconstriction or it increases blood pressure. But these three constituents that, that come out of caffeine or which caffeine is broken into are in fact good for your body because they have the complete opposite effect. So the answer to the question, is coffee good for you or bad for you, really depends on what stays in your body. Is your body primarily being exposed to caffeine or is caffeine being rapidly broken down to these three individual constituents? Because if that's happening, then, well, caffeine is going to be good for your body. And this rate limiting step is governed by CYP1A2 because CYP1A2 is the enzyme that breaks caffeine down into these individual constituents. And at the end of the day, it's really a single mutation or a change of a single nucleotide. When I say a nucleotide, I'm talking about those ATGCs that are present in the DNA. So it's a single change which can turn this enzyme into an enzyme that has a high activity or into an enzyme which has low activity. So individuals that have the 1F allele, they have reduced enzymatic activity. In these individuals, caffeine is metabolized very slowly, so it stays in their blood for longer time periods. And caffeine by itself, it actually restricts or constricts your blood vessels. So these individuals are quite prone to adverse effects of caffeine. Uh, on the flip side, individuals that have the 1A allele, uh, in these individuals, there is rapid or increased enzymatic activity. Caffeine is rapidly broken down into those beneficial constituents that I just talked about. So in their blood, caffeine stays for a very short time. Instead, what they get are those breakdown products. And because those breakdown products are good for the overall cardiovascular health, in these individuals, they are likely to see a very beneficial effect of drinking coffee regularly. So um, uh, this odds ratio is actually based on a meta-analysis from a bunch of publications. And uh, what it means is that if we have an individual who is a slow metabolizer, the individual has the 1F allele. And if this individual was to have, let's say, uh, four or more cups of coffee a day, their risk for hypertension goes up by 300%. Now, the biggest difference is with individuals that are the fast metabolizers. So individuals that are rapid metabolizers, if they're having four or more cups of coffee a day, their risk of hypertension actually is cut down to one third of a normal individual. So what does it all mean? So what it means is if you run the genetic analysis on an individual and you identify that they are the slow metabolizers, then in these individuals, they should be avoiding caffeine intake completely because coffee is going to lead to adverse effects. In contrast, if somebody is a rapid metabolizer, that is, they have the 1A allele, then in these individuals, coffee intake is going to be really good for their cardiovascular health. So these individuals should be advised to be drinking coffee regularly. Um, the other one I'll briefly touch upon is uh, lactose intolerance. So normally, I mean, lactose is a sugar uh, found in milk products and uh, in, the, in our intestinal tract, uh, lactose is broken down by lactase enzyme to glucose and galactose. And individuals who are lactose intolerant, they have very low or perhaps no activity of lactase enzyme. In these individuals, uh, lactose is not broken down. It reaches the colon where it undergoes bacterial fermentation. And then, of course, they, they, uh, they pretty much go through this classical symptoms of flatulence, abdominal pain, and even diarrhea associated with lactose intolerance. But the key is that the activity of lactase in itself is controlled by another gene. That gene is MCM6. So if MCM6 gene is highly active, 
What that means is it promotes production of lactase. And that's why individuals that are carrying T allele of MCM6, in these individuals, lactase enzyme is very active. So in other words, lactase is persistent and they, don't, they do not develop lactose intolerance. In contrast, individuals that are carrying the G allele of MCM6, in these individuals, the activity of MCM6 goes down, which has a negative effect on lactase production. And uh, these individuals uh, do not have persistent production of lactase, and they are at a much higher risk of developing lactose intolerance. But quite simply, you can look at the MCM6 uh, genetic makeup of the individual, and uh, you can come up with these answers if they're susceptible to lactose intolerance or not. And of course, I mean, if they are, what it means is that they should, in fact, be reducing or perhaps trying to eliminate lactose from their diet. So uh, coming back to dietary genetics, so what can uh, dietary genetics help us uncover? Uh, first and foremost, I mean, simple questions like, uh, is the individual at a risk of developing lactose intolerance? Are they at a risk of developing gluten intolerance? Um, is coffee good for you or is it really bad for you? Things such as uh, risk of sodium associated blood pressure because certain variants of certain genes uh, play a role in increasing the predisposition whereby these individuals are going to be at a significantly greater risk if they are uh, having a high intake of sodium. Similarly, uh, um, insulin resistance and starch intake, the risk is again governed by your genes. Uh, snacking tendency, uh, do you have a sweet tooth? All that is governed by your dietary uh, genetics. At the same time, um, again, just like is coffee good for you or bad for you, um, normally we tend to think of whole grain consumption as playing a role in reducing our diabetes risk. Yes, it does do that, but only in a subset of individuals that are carrying some very specific variants of genes. And you got to look at the genetic makeup of the individual to truly address those questions and to uh, come up with a DNA-based diet plan that can maximize health benefits and also to reduce risk of uh, disease development. Uh, the next part I'll be uh, touching upon briefly is of uh, detoxification and genetics. So liver is the primary site where all of the detoxification takes place. And uh, again, that includes uh, chemicals, alcohol, pollutants, uh, hormones, uh, medications, uh, anything that is in our body or goes in our body. And uh, the main subset of enzymes that play a role in detoxification uh, are uh, really the cytochrome P450 enzymatic complex. Detoxification tends to happen in two different phases. Uh, so first of all, there is phase one, uh, where uh, a lot of these fatty toxins are broken down. Um, and in phase two, uh, these, uh, these constituents uh, that, are, that come out of uh, phase one, they are made to be water soluble such that individuals can basically pee them out. And so the purpose of detoxification is that all the chemicals, all the drugs, they are broken down and they are eliminated from your body. But because this entire process is governed by uh, a set of enzymes, and DNA is, of course, what encodes for these enzymes, so changes in, uh, in, an, in an individual's DNA or looking at the kind of variants they have, it plays a role in how certain toxins are uh, metabolized or, or how detoxification takes place in an individual's body. Uh, so one of the examples I'll talk about is uh, pertaining to codeine. Um, so codeine is perhaps the uh, only prescription medication out there which clinically has shown efficacy to control coughing. Um, uh, again, I mean, there are a lot of uh, over-the-counter cough syrups which are available, but uh, there isn't direct clinical data to support their uh, efficacy in controlling cough. Codeine is the only thing that does it. But again, our liver has an enzyme called CYP2D6, which has an ability of converting codeine into morphine. And of course, I mean, if uh, there is a rapid conversion to morphine, then uh, pretty much uh, the individual will start to uh, show symptoms of morphine overdose. So certain individuals can have a very active or very high activity of CYP2D6, such that when, let's say, these individuals have a cough syrup with codeine, or let's say they have uh, Tylenol with codeine, 
The next thing you know, it's rapidly converted to morphine. And now the individual is pretty much uh, feeling as if uh, they have had like an entire bottle of alcohol that they cannot even get up. And that is all governed by your genes. So uh, you can look at the genetic makeup of the individual. You can identify if they do have increased CYP2D6 activity. And if they do, then in these individuals, uh, they should limit codeine intake because even a small amount of codeine is going to hit them hard because they will be exhibiting signs of morphine overdose. And again, it's the genetics of the detox or detoxification system, which helps us answer these questions. And the same goes for um, all the other medications out there. So, uh, uh, I mean, with every medication, uh, there is the underlying risk of adverse effects, but certain individuals are more prone to those adverse effects because it's the detoxification system, which at times is breaking down the medication, is getting rid of it, or at times, is converting the medication into the active form. So the rate at which these enzymes are working to metabolize a particular medication governs what is the risk of an individual to develop an adverse effects or perhaps how effective a medication is going to be in an individual's body. And all that can be addressed by looking at individual's genetic makeup. Uh, the next example I'll talk about uh, pertains to uh, estrogen metabolism. So um, estrogen is produced by ovaries, uh, and at the same time, excess estrogen can lead to uh, proliferation of cells in the breast tissue, uh, which can uh, pretty much lead to uh, cancer or tumor formation. Uh, however, uh, the detox uh, system that we have is designed to remove excess estrogen, and this is to limit uh, the risk of developing uh, breast and or ovarian cancer. So overall, uh, in our body, uh, I mean, CYP3A4 or CYP1B1 or CYP3A5, it converts estrogen into secondary forms, which can then be eliminated by GSTM1 or GSTT1. Uh, and as long as that happens, there is no production of a cancerous molecule, which can increase the risk of developing cancer. But in individuals that have mutations in GSTM1 or GSTT1, uh, these metabolites are not inactivated right away. And these individuals are at a significantly greater risk of developing uh, breast and ovarian cancer simply because uh, of the way how their body is metabolizing estrogen. Now, uh, GSTM1 enzymes, uh, they pretty much uh, play a role in, uh, in detoxification of electrophilic compounds. Uh, such as compounds that uh, cause cancer developments, a lot of toxins, a lot of drugs. And overall, impairment in this enzyme is associated with increased risk of cancers, simply because a lot of these toxins can then not be eliminated from the body. They build up in the body, and next thing you know, they promote development of cancer. And similarly, GSTM1 also plays a role in clearance of cancerous estrogen metabolites. So if someone has, uh, someone is carrying a mutation in GSTM1, which is impairing the function of the enzyme, then the individual is going to be at a greater risk of developing uh, cancer. But the other point to look at is that a lot of these detoxification enzymes are amenable to dietary intervention. So again, this is taken from a study that was published perhaps 10 years ago. Uh, and what it showed was that individuals that had low activity of GSTM1 because of the underlying mutations when they were given resveratrol, which is present in red wine, that actually significantly boosted GSTM and activity. So now, as you can imagine, if someone has, if you look at someone's DNA, the individual has a significant loss of GSTM and activity. So what that means is that the individual is at a high risk of developing breast cancer. But once you have that information, you can have a dietary plan, which actually can pretty much impact activity of these enzymes. You can have a dietary plan, which boosts the activity of these enzymes, such that the risk of developing cancer can be reduced. But again, you can only do that if you look at the genetic makeup of the individual. So what does this all mean? Uh, so you can look at the uh, underlying genetics of an individual to see how they're metabolizing estrogen. Uh, you can identify if genes that are involved in clearance of uh, estrogen metabolites, if they have reduced activity, and at the same time, uh, genes that convert 
non-toxic estrogen into toxic metabolites? Do they have increased activity? And if that's the case, then you can pretty much come up with a dietary plan, which can either reduce or increase activity based on what the genetic map of the individual looks like. And as long as you can do that, what you effectively have is a dietary plan, which not only identifies the risk of developing cancer for an individual, but you're also providing a dietary plan that can in a way manage or perhaps reduce the risk by increasing or reducing the activity of these enzymes as needed. Uh, so again, I mean, usually this is a question I always ask in class where I show the table. So um, again, I'll just go through this with you guys. So uh, the first phase one gene is CYP1A1. So it converts estrogen to 2OHE1. So the individual has normal activity. But when you look at their CYP1B1, they have increased activity, and this leads to faster conversion of estrogen into cancerous 4OHE1. Now, since there is increased conversion of estrogen into a cancerous form, what it means is that this enzymatic or this enzymatic pathway or CYP1B1 in particular needs to be suppressed. And there are certain uh, food groups and uh, certain nutraceuticals which have been identified that can suppress CYP1B1 activity. The other point I'll highlight in this table is uh, if any, if for this specific individual, when you look at GSTM1, well, they have decreased activity of the enzyme. What it means is, again, that the toxic estrogen metabolites are not readily being converted to non-toxic forms, which again is increasing the risk of this individual to develop cancer. So in this case, what we need to do is to boost the activity of GSTM1, which can be done by perhaps giving a supplement with resveratrol in there. Now, uh, coming back to uh, disease risk and genetics. So uh, uh, diabetes overall, I mean, carries a a huge cost on a global level. Uh, again, I mean, these are numbers from 2007 in the US. Uh, the latest number tend to indicate that it, it, it costs the, uh, the country around 300 billion USD every year. And uh, when you talk about diabetes, I mean, diabetes tend to, tends to be a multi-genetic disease. So it's not about, oh, you're carrying a single mutation and now you will going to, you're going to get diabetes. That's not how type 2 diabetes functions. So uh, there are, in fact, multiple genes which act in tandem to mediate the risk of developing type 2 diabetes. And again, this is a very simplistic figure that shows how different genes can play a role in type 2 diabetes development. So um, uh, let's say um, th this is an individual who's carrying a set of genes, which makes them hungry all the time. Now, next thing you know, they're uh, going to their McDonald's drive through every day, grabbing a hamburger with a large fries. And now let's say it's the same set. It's the same individual who has another set of genes that increases or increases the risk of insulin resistance. Now, this genetic mutation combined with their, with their increased tendency to be hungry all the time leads to them being overweight. So overall, what's happening is, I mean, they are eating more. And then at the same time, they have a set of genes, which is increasing their risk of developing insulin resistance as, as every day passes. So this individual ends up becoming overweight. Now, there could be a third set of mutations whereby in these individuals, the, uh, the beta islet cells in the pancreas, which produce insulin, wear out pretty uh, rapidly compared to a normal individual who has the wild type copy of the gene. So what happens is with this individual, uh, he or she keeps on going to McDonald's every day. They keep on getting uh, overweight. And eventually what happens is that their beta islet cells pretty much wear out. And next thing you know, what they have is type 2 diabetes. But the key point to highlight is that it's three different sets of genes that are working in tandem to uh, have this individual go on develop type 2 diabetes. But beforehand, if you have an understanding of the different mutations the individual is carrying, a lot of the environmental factors or lifestyle factors that led to development of type 2 diabetes can be controlled. And that is the power of genetics. Uh, now, again, I mean, this is actually taken from uh, one of our reports. So when we look at the uh, risk of an individual to develop type 2 diabetes, we are looking at a host of different genes. Uh, and then it's a, it's a multi-gene AI algorithm that identifies the true risk of an individual. And it's classified as the individual having a low risk, a moderate risk, or a high risk.
So what happens if somebody is at a high risk? Well, you have to take a, a, a multifaceted approach to reduce disease risk. Because again, when you look at type 2 diabetes, uh, a a good chunk of what, what leads to type 2 diabetes development uh, tends to be um, the overall lifestyle. And how do you modify the lifestyle of the individual? How do you make them live a healthier life? Well, that's where the dietary, nutritional, and fitness planning based on the individual's DNA comes into play. Similarly, if the individual is obese, you need to have a weight loss plan based on their DNA to make sure they actually lose weight. And at the same time, you want to improve the health of the individual, which can be done by modulation of detoxification pathways, which you can once you look at the genetic makeup of the individual. And at the same time, the other key to remember that we have seen with a lot of, uh, a lot of patients is that once people understand the underlying risk, there is in fact a greater compliance to health and wellness plans as well. So in terms of my final thoughts, overall, when you're offering a, a generic plan or what we can call a non-DNA-based health plan, there tend to be three different outcomes. That is, the plan is going to work. It's probably going to work uh, somewhat with slight efficacy, or it's not going to work at all. But if you're offering a DNA-based personalized health plan, then what you'll see is that the only outcome tends to be potent efficacy, because this health plan is based on the biology and the genetic makeup of the individual. And uh, again, with that, I'll provide a bit of an introduction to Enant Life, that how can you uh, incorporate genetic testing to help your clients? And that is what we are doing at Enant Life. So uh, we are offering uh, low-cost, affordable, uh, predictive genetic kits. And uh, it's really about uh, improving the uh, overall quality of life of people. And again, Considering what the world is dealing with right now, there is perhaps even a bigger room or even there is a bigger need for people to understand the underlying genetic makeup so uh, they can overall have betterment of their health. Uh, how does it all work? Uh, the testing is, uh, happens actually through saliva. So uh, there are these specialized kits where the patient or the client provides their saliva. We extract DNA from cells. The DNA is sequenced. We compare this to a reference sequence, and then we have our AI algorithms, which actually uh, do the analysis for risk stratification. And what makes us unique? Well, we are offering by far uh, the most comprehensive and robust arrays of genetic tests in North America. It's a next generation sequencing platform, so not a SNP array. Um, the accuracy is over 99.5% because we are sequencing every piece of DNA at least 50 times to ensure that kind of accuracy. And this is clinical grade genetic testing, not consumer grade genetic testing. And there is in fact a big difference between the two. Um, and again, that is something uh, that uh, I do cover extensively in the course, which I'll be talking about uh, shortly. Uh, but the key is uh, that our test can never be taken by the client or the patient directly, because again, at the end of the day, it's healthcare information that needs to be analyzed. And that can only be done by a healthcare provider. Because again, if you give a layman a genetic report, I mean, they, they again, they simply will not be able to make much sense out of it. There is a lot of knowledge that you need to actually decipher those reports and to turn that into meaningful information for betterment of health. And of course, these tests are affordable. So from the clinical perspective, what we offer um, are uh, there are tests that we offer to look at the uh, risk of developing breast and ovarian cancer. We offer tests to look at the risk of prostate cancer in men. Uh, we offer tests to look at the risk of colorectal cancer. We have a very extensive autoimmunity panel. And we also offer a test to look at the risk of brain disorders, such as uh, Alzheimer's, uh, dementia, uh, Huntington's, and Parkinson's. Uh, perhaps the ones that are uh, the most relevant uh, to you guys is really the health and wellness genetic test, which I'll talk about in a, uh, in a moment, and the cannabis genetic test. So the cannabis genetic test is actually designed to look at how the individual's body is going to respond to CBD and THC um, from um, the medical perspective in terms of having a health benefit and also in terms of having uh, an adverse reaction. Um, at the same time, from the clinical perspective, we also offer ethnicity-based screening kits where 
these kits or these genetic tests are designed to uh, look at the risk of certain genetic diseases that are perhaps more prominent in certain communities. Uh, but I guess the one that uh, has been readily used by, um, uh, by the alumni of IHN uh, is our health and wellness genetic test. So uh, this test has been developed by a team of physicians, geneticists, pharmacologists, fitness experts. And what it's doing is a broad analysis of the genetic makeup of the individual to identify what needs to be done to optimize their health. Um, and, uh, and again, so uh, this is really covering the dietary nutritional plans that we just talked about. This is going into the exercise fitness regimens based on the individual's genetic makeup. It's looking at the risk of individuals to, uh, to adverse effects from commonly used medications. And uh, at the same time, it's also looking at ide identifying uh, modifications that uh, need to be, the dietary mod or lifestyle modifications that need to be recommended to the patient to improve their health. Um, overall, what it's covering is the uh, complete detoxification genetic profile. It's looking at the um, estrogen metabolism genetic profile, the risk of developing testosterone deficiency. It's looking at the risk of developing vitamin deficiency for many different vitamins, many different minerals. It's looking at the risk of developing type 2 diabetes, elevated cholesterol level, triglycerides, food intolerances, such as gluten intolerance, lactose intolerance. It's looking at exercise physiology in terms of what fitness regimens are going to work best for the individual based on their genetic makeup. It's looking at weight loss plans, and it's looking at alcohol dependence as well. And, um, we have a special promotion going on for uh, for IHN. So overall, the way how the testing works is uh, that providers, they set up an account with us. And normally we charge $200 for setting up an account, but IHN alumni, they can set it for 99 bucks. And with that, what they get are uh, four tests with prepaid shipping along with marketing materials. Normally, the price of our test to clinical providers is uh, $340. Uh, but for IHN alumni, uh, or IHN students, it's uh, $306. And when they ship the test with the sample back to us, that's when they, but we bill them the amount of $306. Uh, but of course, they are free to charge whatever they want from their clients. That is something that we do not govern. And this is a completely, uh, this is completely a saliva-based genetic test. There is no need for blood work. And the key is that there is no refrigeration, which is needed as these saliva samples, uh, especially in the kits that we are using, are in fact stable at room temperature for up to six months. And at uh, Ananth Life, again, I mean, our mandate is really to uh, empower everyone with the information that they were born with. I mean, uh, to put it uh, in a simplistic fashion, what we're doing is we are reading your DNA and we are providing you uh, the information that you always had in you. And it should, uh, it should be more of a life plan that you should be living by so that you can optimize your health and perhaps you can lead a longer and a healthier life with that. Now, uh, the course that I teach at IHN is Understanding Genetics for Improving Health Outcomes. Uh, the course will begin on June 9th, and it'll go on till July 28th. Uh, it's going to be uh, on Wednesdays from 6 to 9.30 p.m. EST, and, or, or, or 3 to 6.30 p.m. PST. And uh, the purpose of the course is... Uh, to go over how genetics can be utilized in nutrition, detoxification, weight loss, overall health and wellness. Now, what I'll say is that everything that I talked about today, pretty much every single slide is a chapter in itself. And the purpose of the course is that when you're done with this course, you should have the skill set whereby if you read a genetics report, not only you can understand what it means, but the key is that you can come up with a life plan for the individual based on their genetic results. And that is what leads to uh, the highest efficacy in terms of improving health outcomes. Thank you, Dr. Kushwa. That was uh, some uh, information to think about, definitely to question and think about and absorb. And um, very, very, very inspiring, hun. Thanks, Elizabeth. It's my pleasure. Always great to see you, Raul. Looking so forward to your course. And thank you to everyone that attended tonight. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Good night. Bye.